Okay. All right, so welcome again, everybody. My name is Kayla Alawi, and on behalf of Atmosphere Press, I am so excited, as always, to introduce you to today's holiday season event featuring new fiction from Atmosphere Press. Today, you can find the perfect gift for readers of all sorts of genres. Uh, we'll be hearing from J.B. Blake reading from The Killer Half, which was released October 1st. E.K. McCoy reading from When Stars Align, which was released October 4th, and David Gautier Jr. reading from Little Town Blues, which was released November 1st. Mm -hmm. All three authors' books can be purchased both from online retailers and from select bookstores. And of course, the books can be ordered on Atmosphere Press's <laughs> website. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, of course, they can also be ordered from Atmosphere Press's website at atmosphereprescom forward slash books. Please see the links in the chat. At the end of the event, we will also have time for any audience questions. So during the readings, if you have a question for any of our authors, you can type it in the chat and I will make sure it gets asked. And then during the actual reading, please stay muted just so we can keep extraneous sound at a minimum. Of course, you can certainly always use the chat also for praise and comments in addition to questions. And one last note, we at Atmosphere Press appreciate your support today and always. And if you have a manuscript of your own, we would love to read it. So feel free to submit your work to books at atmospherepress.com. Again, thank you so much for tuning in today and supporting JB, Emily, and Dave. Let's start off with our first reader, who is JB Blake. JB is a student of military history, behavioral science, servant leadership, critical thinking, innovation, and economics. With a background as a successful entrepreneur and intrapreneur, corporate executive, oops, and university professor, Every career path has led to interactions with fascinating characters whose traits could be woven into the killer half. In JB's debut novel, Hawk witnesses the death of a loved one, which is the final blow that shatters his spirit. He declines reenlistment and returns home brokenhearted only to find another war beginning. Book View Review rated the killer half five stars and called the book a taut cat and mouse tale that keeps the action moving and readers on the edge of their seats. Readers who come for a propulsive military thriller high on action won't be disappointed. JB, the virtual podium is yours. Okay, well, with that review, I'm kind of anxious to read it myself. I'm going to give you uh, a little more context for the book, and then I will do a reading and give you uh, a couple of ex excerpts from it. Again, the name of my book is The Killer Half, The Legend of Blackhawk Six Deuce. Blackhawk Six Deuce is an alias, but everyone just calls the hero of this book Hawk. Hawk is an elite military operator in the world of people who need an alias, his work is mainly that of an assassin. He is a ghost. He gets in, gets out. No one knows that he was there. Hawk's family consists of three dogs. There is a gigantic dog named Snow, who is a some breed of desert dog that nobody knows. And he, then he has Lizzie and Lily, who are two of the much larger breed of Jack, Ter Jack Russell Terriers. Uh, they're his dogs, but they have been trained in middle military specialties like guarding, scent detection, lethal and non-lethal attack, but uh, primarily they're killers just like Hawk is. His skills and proficiency come to the attention of the Department of Defense. They recruit him from the military to interfere in foreign politics to impose American will and make it look like another nation did it. These are false flag operations. He is paired with a buddy to form a two-man, three-dog hunter-killer team. As successful operations begin to add up, a sense of remorse comes over him. He complains that there is no loyalty. Last week's friend is this week's enemy in American policy. 
he meets a young woman and is in the beginning of creating a relationship with her when she is killed on live TV by a notorious gang of terrorists. This gang has a bounty on their heads because of a brutal attack on citizens in London. British MI6 is willing to pay tens of millions of dollars for their deaths. Hawk accomplishes this and videos the whole thing on his phone. When he goes to the MI6 field office in country, the arrogant MI6 section chief refuses to authorize payment and dares Hawk to do something about it with his little team and asks how many are on his little team. Hawk responds, it is a two-man hunter-killer team, and I am the killer half. Hawk is despondent. Uh, he receives his payment from the Brits in two days in gold and silver in his vault in America, but he's despondent after the death of the girl, and he is suffering from severe PTS. His enlistment is up, and he goes home. Hawk goes to Arizona to recuperate. He takes an armed walk in the Sonoran Desert for relaxation, and I will add that's the only way I would walk in the Sonoran Desert today would be armed. But he discovers a young teenage girl who is about to be raped by the men bringing a group of border crossers into the country. Hawk stops it by shooting the men. He discovers plans on one of them that indicate America will have an armed invasion by a much larger army soon. Hawk goes into hiding and begins recruiting a resistance force from special forces contacts at home and abroad. He has a plan and he is putting the pieces together. He gets out of the way of the initial attack and rents a cabin in the mountains and woods north of Durango, Colorado. He and the dogs are there for two days when this happens. At a little before 10 in the morning, he couldn't believe what he heard. A vehicle was on the road. Then he heard the vehicle hit something, and then a sound like the vehicle was running over some bushes. Hawk took a quick look out the door. That piece of road was about an eighth of a mile from the cabin. There was a Cadillac Escalade with its front tires hanging over the edge of what was probably a 200 meter drop. There was a passenger in the front seat. He grabbed a small coil of paracord, said to the dogs, let's go, and moved as quick as his boots would let him on the ice. He took one end of the paracord and tied it around his waist. There was a tree by the road. The escalade had bounced off of it. Hawk anchored the loose end of the paracord with a bowline to the tree. He hung onto the paracord as he was moving and sliding at times to the vehicle. He hollered to the driver, turn off the engine. The dogs were waiting and watching by the tree. He got close enough to see the driver was a young woman. He got to the driver's side door and said, unhook your seatbelt slowly and open the door gently. She did as she was instructed. Now, swing your legs out carefully. Don't push off from the vehicle. Just fall right out to me. As she turned to him, he recognized her. Her films had been shown when he was in Afghanistan. She was just 18 now, but had won two Academy Award Oscars by her 17th birthday. She was widely considered one of the most beautiful young women in the world. It would have been impossible not to recognize her. With long blonde hair, five feet, six inches tall, a beautiful and expressive face, and a figure that would make a Greek goddess jealous, Leah Parker literally fell into Hawk's arms. Hawk, catching his breath awkwardly because he was stunned by how gorgeous she was, all he could think to say was, do you have any luggage? Leah, still terrified from looking through the windshield at nothing but empty space, and our heart raising from fear, responded haltingly, yes, a uh, uh, two... Two bags in back. She buried her face momentarily on his shoulder. Hawk said, hang on to me with both arms. It is extremely slippery here. He had reverted to his military personality of giving orders and maintaining an emotional distance from civilians. As she put her feet on the ice and her arms around Hawk, 
He felt her trembling with fear. He had one arm around her and was feeding back to paracord with his free hand into a tight coil in the other hand. They got as far as the back of the vehicle. Leo was wearing boots, but they did not have a good soul for this kind of ice. Hawk said, keep a tight hold on me with both arms and do your best to walk with me. We'll take it slow until we get off this ice. They got halfway to the tree, almost off the ice, when they heard a loud crack behind them. The ice they were on tilted suddenly, causing both of them to fall down, with Hawk on his back and Leah on top of him. Leah screamed with fear at the sudden movement of the ice. They both looked back at the vehicle. They were on an ice shelf that had built up from the rain freeze cycle. They weren't on ground at all. The vehicle's engine and the weight of the vehicle was breaking the edge of the ice. Without any additional warning, the ice under the vehicle gave way completely and the vehicle disappeared over the edge. Worse yet, the ice shelf tilted more to the edge and they began to slide toward oblivion. Hawk dug in his heels and held tight to the paracord as Leo screamed, oh no! But he knew this whole ice shelf was likely to break away and leave them, two of them, dangling in air. Hawk's right arm was still extended and holding the paracord attached to the tree. He called to his dog, Snow. Snow, come schnell her. Hawk often referred to, referred to dog commands in German because in this case, they responded more quickly. It was literally snow, come here fast. The big dog with large pads and big claws was able to navigate the ice to get to Hawk and Leah. Hawk said again to Snow, Nimm meinen Arm und seid uns schnell, literally, grab my arm and pull us fast. The big dog engulfed Hawk's arm with her muzzle, dug in with her claws, and began pulling them up the slope. They could hear more ice cracking and falling behind them. Another worry for Hawk was about snow. If the shelf broke away while she was on it, she would be a goner along with the two of them. And it was at that point that my printer stopped printing. So if you wanna know what happened to Hawk, Leah and Snow, you're, you're going to have to read the book. So, <laughs> Let me let me share just uh, two brief excerpts from the book, uh, just to give you kind of a flavor of the rest of it. Earlier in Hawk's career, one of his assignments is to cause two warring factions in uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan to fight each other. And he successfully accomplishes that, and he's trying to get out. He's walking out of the area. He's on foot. And he gets to a remote area. There's gunfire around him. It's all AK-47 gunfire. But there's a little house there. And he hears a woman who is in pain. And so he checks around the house, and there's nothing. And he looks in the house. And there is a young woman in there who is giving birth right at that moment, with bullets flying around everywhere. And he goes in. And she begs him to help her deliver the baby. He's really reluctant. This big, tough warrior is reluctant to help a woman deliver a baby. But finally, he gets over it. He helps deliver the baby, takes care of everything, wraps the child up, puts the little girl on her mother's chest. And the mom says, what should I name her? And Hawk being a typical man, listening to the gunfire around him, says, well, you could call her AK because of what's going on around us. And mom kind of declines that politely, and she comes up with a name for the little girl that is uh, really cute and kind of poignant. And I think you will like it if, if you're reading in the book in, in that part of the story. And then the last excerpt that I will give you uh, happened in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> when Hawk was there with a larger team. And again, they had done a false flag thing. And uh, they were staying in the free trade zone of Riyadh, which is um, 
and there's no Sharia law there, so it's it kind of anything goes. And uh, they were staying in a place that literally just said hotel on the outside of it. And the locals all knew it as a no-tell hotel. It was one where you rented rooms by the hour, and it was a really good idea if you brought your own sheets. Now, I'm sorry, that sounds crude, but it's just the truth. I am told there are places like this that exist. And uh, they got a call from actually the British prime minister. And he said, one of our MPs was down there, member of parliament, was negotiating a deal. She went to a nightclub and her MI6 security team abandoned her because she's part of a committee that is looking to defund one of their operations. And she's outside the wire without any help. Can you help? Hawk says, where is she? They say, well, she went to a place called the Miss Teak Nightclub. And Hawk says, we're right across the street from there. And the MPs, the PM says, do you have any weapons? And Hawk says, we never leave home without our weapons. So they get dressed in the same stuff that they used before, for whatever reason they had this. Most of the team has on long Arab robes with M4 rifles underneath the ro robes. And there's a fellow uh, known as Uncle Peter, is, is his alias, and he's dressed in a wild Hawaiian shirt with an M9, Beretta M9 on his hip. And he's, he's the spotter at the front door. They go into this nightclub. Hawk is dressed in kind of a cream, light cream colored suit with a blue shirt, open neck. If any of you remember uh, uh, Crockett in uh, Miami Vice, well, that's what he looked like, except a much larger version uh, than that. And he spots this uh, this MP, member of parliament in there. It's a very lovely woman named Sarah Stewart. She's sitting underneath the stand where the uh, DJ would normally sit. A lot of people on dance floor, but he goes right to her. <clears throat> and he says, Sarah Stewart, remember me? John Windsor from Cambridge. Well, she recognized the name Windsor as being the Queen's family or the royal family name. And she went to Cambridge, but she didn't remember him. So he sits down immediately and kisses her. And then he whispers in her ear, Sarah, I was sent here to rescue you. There's somebody coming to kidnap you. It's a big team. And... When they come through the door, I'm going to tilt this steel top table up, push you down behind it, and there's going to be a lot of gunfire. Now, can you just look back at me and give me a smile like I just told you something, you know, really naughty and and uh, just help me out here? And she leaned back and she said, well, I can do better than that, Huck. And she gave him a smile and she kissed him back. And then his spotter at the front door, Uncle Peter, says, they're here, they're walking in, there's 12. They look like a bad, uh, they look like body doubles of a bad crew that I saw, saw in Chicago once. And Hawk says, give me a countdown. And he reaches back and grabs a microphone off of the DJ stand. Peter says, three, two, one, they're out there. Hawk turns on the microphone and says, there are snakes on the dance floor, snakes everywhere, snakes, snakes. Get off the floor. People scream, run for the sides. The only people left on the dance floor are the 12 kidnappers and their spotter. And at that point, Huck pushes the table forward, pushes Sarah Stewart down behind it. And gunfire ensues. Now, does he save Sarah? Do they get together afterwards? Does she ever know his real name? I don't know. I can't tell you right at this moment. But if you buy the book and read, you will know. John, and that's you a, are like a salesman right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone can resist buying this book now. <laughs> and, that, and that's all I have for you tonight. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I, I feel like you really um, brought that to life. I mean, even with the dialogue and, and now obviously, like I said, everyone has to like pick this book up now, but, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This is yes. amazing.
Um, all right, so up next, we are happy to introduce you to E.K. McCoy. E.K. McCoy is a Cincinnati, Ohio native who currently resides in Hawaii. At the age of 10, she fell in love with the magic she created using a simple spell that consisted of a pen, a composition book, a flashlight, and her imagination. She spent 14 years as a medical professional before she decided it was time to cast a new spell and trade in her scrubs for a MacBook. She and her husband, Kyle, enjoy traveling and spending time with their two fun-loving daughters, Ellie and Ava. In When Stars Align, Dr. Augustus Owens is the trauma specialist working that pivotal night when a nearly unrecognizable woman is brought into the ER. As he works tirelessly to save her life, he notices a familiar jagged scar on the left side of her neck. He is overwhelmed by the gut-wrenching realization that the woman's life that balances in his hands is none other than his one and only lost love, Elsie McCormick. The book commentary calls When Stars Align a delightful romance with a deftly accomplished plot, unforgettable characters, and superior storytelling. So, Emily, take it away. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So I am actually picked to read from chapter 10. I chose chapter 10. I know it's in the middle of the book, but with it being close to Christmas, the story takes place, or chapter 10 is taking place in Cincinnati, Ohio at Christmas time. So the beginning of the book starts with Elsie and she has been in a terrible accident and she's taken to the local hospital where a trauma specialist, Dr. Augustus Owens is working that night. And as he's working on her, he recognizes the scar on the side of her neck and realizes that it's Elsie. So then the story goes back in time and takes you to the time that they were dating, which is when they were in college and when they were falling in love. And then you get to see how their romance story unfolds. And you don't know if Elsie survives or not until the end. And you don't know what happens with Elsie and Aggie. So here we go. Chapter 10. Since that Saturday night, Elsie and Aggie made sleepovers part of their weekly routine. They were falling fast and hard and loving every minute of it. Thanksgiving passed with Aggie working and Elsie, disappointed but understanding of his schedule, spent the holiday at home with Olive. That's her grandma. Before she knew it, Elsie's favorite time of the year had arrived, Christmas time. She loved everything about Christmas, the lights, the snow, the decorations, and especially how everyone seemed happier, kinder, and more loving at Christmas time. The first week of December, Elsie helped Olive decorate the house, and then she decorated her apartment. In the weeks that followed, she found herself telling stories to Aggie about some of the things she enjoyed doing with her parents when she was a child. One night, the pair headed downtown to Fountain Square to ice skate. This is something Elsie's father took her to do every year. After his passing, she hadn't felt like going back, but this year was different. This year, she had Augie. She surprised herself that she was still able to do a few spins, a simple jump, and skate backwards. It wasn't anything special really, but to Augie, she was practically a pro. After showing off a few of her moves, she spent the rest of the night skating next to him, holding his hand as he stumbled around the rink. Augie laughed as he fell backwards and pulled her down with him. I'm sorry I can't be as short as you are and have a smaller center of gravity, he teased. The snow fell down around them as they lay laughing on the ice. Augie tried to stand only to fall back down again, knocking Elsie over in the process. They were laughing so hard that neither of them could stand up. People stared as they skated around them, but they didn't seem to care. Once Augie was finally able to stand, he skated behind Elsie, placing his hands on her shoulders and using her as his guide. As she skated slowly in front of him, pulling him along, he said, I never knew being so awful at something could be so fun. He tried to kiss the top of her head only to lose his footing again and fall back down. As she helped him up, she noted, you make everything fun. He stood, pulled her in close and kissed her passionately, not caring about the crowd around them. 
When he pulled away, he said, no, we make everything fun together. Elsie was glad her cheeks were already red from being out in the cold because she, she could feel herself flushing. That night, they laughed so hard they cried as Augie repeatedly tumbled to the ice and pulled Elsie down on top of him. By the end of the night, they were both covered in ice and snow and shivering in their wet clothes. They didn't seem to notice how cold they were until they got off the ice. They held each other close as they sipped their hot chocolate and walked the streets lined with red, white, and green Christmas lights. When they arrived at Augie's car, the snow was still falling down around them. Augie leaned down and kissed Elsie before opening the car door for her. She knew her father would be happy that after all of these years, she was finally able to enjoy one of their father-daughter traditions with the man she was uncontrollably and undoubtedly falling in love with. The week before Christmas was finals week for Elsie. Elsie was fortunate to have only a few finals. On the Sunday before final week, Marie and Elsie spent an entire morning baking their favorite holiday goodies, peanut butter blossoms, chocolate chip, and sugar cookies. They needed stress food to keep them motivated and to get them through exams. While Elsie was busy studying, Augie was busy working, but each night he'd bring dinner to Elsie and Marie. Marie ate in her room, too busy cramming to come down and join them. Elsie would take a break from studying and enjoy some downtime with Augie. Thanks for bringing us dinner, Elsie said gratefully as she watched Augie place her sandwich down on the dining room table in front of her, and then he headed into the kitchen. You didn't bring one for yourself? She asked. Nope, he called back from the kitchen. Elsie could hear the sound of the refrigerator door opening and closing. Augie pouring something into a glass and something going onto a plate. Augie returned to the dining room holding a big plate of cookies, a glass of milk, and a huge smile on his face. When you told me you were baking cookies this morning, I knew what I was eating for dinner, he said as he sh shoved an entire peanut butter blossom cookie into his mouth. His blue eyes danced with excitement. He reminded Elsie of a kid in a candy store. Seriously, Els, what do you put in these things, crack? He asked with a mouthful of cookie. Now I know the secret to keeping you around, she said, cookies. Yep, keep making these and I'll never leave you, he teased as he dipped his cookie into some milk before taking a bite and sitting down at the table next to her. When are you heading home for Christmas? He asked after taking a big gulp of milk. Um, I'm not sure, maybe after exams on Wednesday. I wasn't sure what you were doing she said, leaving her sentence unfinished. He didn't talk much about his family, but from what she got gathered, he wasn't close to his father and wouldn't be joining him for the holiday. She wanted to ask him to spend some time with her on Christmas, but being new to the dating game, she didn't know if it was too soon. Also, she knew that if he came to her house, that was opening the door to questioning about her past. She, was, she wanted Augie to know everything about her, but had never made herself that vulnerable to anyone. I'm not doing anything this week, he said, as he took a bite of a sugar cookie covered in green frosting. And I don't have to work Christmas day, he said nonchalantly. She tried to summon the courage to ask him to spend Christmas with her. She hadn't asked Olive if he could join them, but she knew Olive would want to meet him. Elsie opened her mouth to try to ask the one simple question, would you like to have dinner with Olive and me? but her throat instantly tightened and instead she shoved another bite of her sandwich in her mouth, swallowed hard and tried to clear her throat with a big drink of water. She avoided eye contact with Augie as she realized her face must be bright red. She didn't understand how he could still make her feel this nervous after three months of dating. I'll probably just relax, watch some movies, maybe steal some of your cookies for dinner, he hinted. She knew he was trying to make it easier for her to ask him what he knew she wanted to ask. Her heart quickened as she picked up her sandwich and shyly offered. You could eat dinner with us, I mean, if you want to. She could feel her hands begin to shake a little as she waited for him to answer. This was a big deal. It was the first time she ever invited a, home, a boy home to meet Olive. Hmm, he said, pretending to contemplate her offer. Let me think about this eat cookies by myself or spend time with my girlfriend and meet her grandma and eat a delicious dinner. 
Elsie knew he was only teasing when she looked him in the face to see him flashing that huge teethy playful grin. Her hand, her hand stopped shaking and she started laughing. I think I'll just stay home and eat some cookies, he laughed as she playfully smacked his arm. Oh, you're going to pay for that, he said as Elsie tried to get up and run, but it was no use. He was already out of his chair and sweeping her into his arms. As she screeched with laughter, he carried her upstairs to her bedroom. They lay, there they lay next to each other, kissing and laughing. I'd love to meet Olive, he whispered as he kissed her forehead and added, and I'd love to spend Christmas with you. She looked at his bright blue eyes and gently rubbed his muscular bicep. She still wasn't sure how she managed to find a guy as perfect as him. Not only was he good looking and smart, but he made her laugh and he liked her for who she was. He never tried to change her. For once in her life, things were going well and that realization made her uneasy. Trying to ignore the uneasy feeling, she kissed her boyfriend and concentrated only on how exciting it would be having him at her house for Christmas. So to find out if Elsie lives or dies and if there's a second chance at this romance, you have to read more. Everyone is learning many good things from JB. <laughs> <laughs> but also, thank you, Emily. I admittedly, I'm already familiar with the story, but it's so impressive that even in that one short excerpt, I can feel all of these emotions at war in Elsie. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I agree, everyone here, you definitely need to find out what happens in the story. <laughs> so um, before you do that, though, our final reader today is David Gautier. Dave is a freelance interdisciplinary artist, college professor, and writing coach with a BA in theater from the University of New Hampshire, an MS in film from Boston University, and an MFA in writing from Goddard College in Vermont. He lives in New Hampshire with his wife, Karen, and daughter, Shelby. He is a published author of two books on film criticism, one of them being the de definitive book on filmmaker Alan Parker. He is also a filmmaker, theater practitioner, and songwriter who is often featured on New Hampshire radio. Little Town Blues is his first novel. So is Little Town Blues a genre-bending spin to the police procedural novel, or a stylized variation on the mystery horror novel with touches of melodrama, or is it a ghost story with a splash of parapsychology? No matter how you decide to categorize Little Town Blues, at its core, it critiques small town America through the lens of ethics, traditions, creativity, repression, the illusion of fame and diversity, gender identity, and undiagnosed mental illnesses. It won the Literary Titan Gold Award, and Literary Titan says that with its innovative delivery and a healthy dose of melodrama, Little Town Blues is a thrilling genre-crossing novel with mystery and suspense. And with that, let's welcome Dave. We go. My microphone wasn't going on. Good. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. No, this is really exciting to be here. Um, yeah, and a lot of that, what we just heard was from the back of the book. I actually worked a lot on the back of the book, and I, I think that, that that's a great hook for to be able to kind of get a sense of what a book's about. I'm going to just read the a, another part of that to get a sense of, because this has a lot of characters. This is like has nine characters, and they're all sort of quirky, and they're interchangeable. So this will sort of add in a little detail here, and, I, and then I'll give a couple of excerpts from, from the novel itself. Um, so yeah, so here's, starting off here, set in the mythical New England microcosm of Frybury Falls, Little Town Blues tells the story of nine characters in the spring, summer, and fall of 1984. Mild-mannered police chief Mike Melanson, his eccentric, prophetic wife, prophetic, not pathetic, <laughs> Miss Julie, and their empathetic son, Adam. The gifted and tarnished Pearson brothers, former best-selling writer Sam, and former high school coach and teacher George, marked by tragedy and scandal. Hard-boiled musician Moira Davis and her precocious teenage daughter Megan going through her own coming-of-age story. 
and the diabolical deputy Jack Cleary and his emotionally tortured brain injured son, JJ. This interwoven mosaic of small town neuroses and psychoses leads to a quirky scandal involving the chief of police which you have to read the book in order to figure out what the scandal is. <laughs> Thank you for, for that, like sort of like advertisement <laughs> that everybody's getting here. So I, I was thinking of, you know, um, it's always I'm trying to, you know, still sort of deciding like how to kind of feature this. But what I think I'll do is a couple of excerpts. And I have a couple of chapters that sort of a lead in into the world of Frybury Falls, because it's very much kind of a living, breathing. So, so I'll read a short segment from that too, and then either one or two short segments of that too. And I, and I, and I'll be, I, I can be chatty, so I'll be very aware of time. So I want to be, yeah. Um, okay, so this is, this is starting right off in chapter one called Gunter's Milliard and Niagara Two. Frybury Falls was so small that whenever anyone mentioned the town to outsiders, they would ask, where's that? To them, it might as well have been another planet. Aside from the fact that it was so close to Boston, it was, in a lot of ways, another planet. It was an old mill town that, like its neighboring Massachusetts towns, Amesbury and Newburyport, did business manufacturing hats, carriages, and clipper ships during the Industrial Revolution of the early 20th century. In the center of this otherwise menial place existed a little haven of sorts, named after Frybury Falls entrepreneur Alexander Gunter a German-American who made a killing in some new business in the 1950s that manufactured soap and vitamins. Gunter fronted the money to build what he eventually called Paradise Park around the remarkable and mysterious waterfall, which, according to him, was the nucleus of this little town. Someone once called the waterfall Niagara II, and the name always seemed to stick. The waterfall was apparently the result of some underwater phenomenon. Legend has it that a native of Frybury Falls named Ro Roderick William Hayes Gorman, an eccentric old scientist, philosopher, or geophilosopher, as he liked to call himself, inventor and politician of the 1920s, concluded the following. The waterfall was created by a spontaneous underwater geologic reaction, something to do with subduction, like Niagara Falls, only not nearly as epic in nature. Underneath the Merrimack River, some time ago, an earthquake must have occurred. It was like a big bang from below. Very strange indeed, especially for this part of the country. Some say that forces beyond created it, something supernatural. Legend also has it that Gorman frequently reported strange goings on down at the waterfall throughout the, his lifetime. He even said that the waterfall talked to him. <laughs> as the story unfolds, you'll see that this old buffoon wasn't as crazy as people said he was. In addition to Niagara too, Gunter's Milliard contained a number of noteworthy spectacles, all products of the entrepreneur's paradise park. Rows of weeping willow trees, red, white, and blue brick and gravel paths, finely crafted pine benches, all representing the colors of the American flag, a black and white stone wall surrounding a fantastic greenhouse where exotic tropical looking plants and flowers inexplicably grew all year long, and a theater in the round modeled after Greek and Roman architecture, replete with marble stairs, pillars, and other gaudy abstract artifacts and sculptures, including a column made of granite that resembled the crystal monolith in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Incidentally, nobody ever put on any formal productions in this theater. The space was merely used as a picnic ground of sorts, which outraged Mike Melanson's wife, Julie, who dedicated her life to the performing arts and always insisted that this theater should be, have been utilized solely for the plays of Euripides, Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Aristophanes. There are two ways that one could enter Gunter's Milliard. The first way would be to come in from Main Street in the downtown area. That's where most folks would enter. The other way was through the woods by way of a small stretch of forest that contained a variety of dirt paths. Each path was a trail leading from Gunter's Milliard to all the major dead ends off of Baker Street, Frybury Falls' longest and least traveled avenue. All the aforementioned people would conveniently enter Gunter's Milliard by using one of these trails. So that's the, that's the opening. And I figured I'd do it justice. I'll pro probably try to read um, just an excerpt from another chapter. This is a, um, a scene between um, Moira, who's a, um, who's, who's, she's, a, she's a songwriter, um, and her teenage daughter, uh, Megan. And it's, 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 it's kind of building their relationship, which is in some levels is, is sort of estranged 
but they're they're both sort of willing to make make things work out. This chapter, this is chapter nine from the book, and it's called Worlds Apart. Megan hadn't been in the bathroom five minutes before the vomiting began. Then the coughing kicked in. The nausea and sweats had finally gotten the best of the girl. The guitar playing stopped. Megan, honey, you okay in there? No answer. Honey, Megan thought, kneeling down in front of the toilet bowl, her face practically inside the water. Again, Mora asked if her Megan honey was okay. What a freak, thought the girl. Honey, Mora was not a honey kind of mother. Well, not generally anyways. The girl knew, however, that in her own eccentric, demented way, her mother loved her. But she was also aware that her mother's musical career came first, before motherhood or any other domestic responsibilities. It always did. On most of the nights when Mora would drive into Boston for a gig or two, Megan would either stay with her father and her uncle George or by herself in Brown Ave, where she would have the entire house to herself until her mother returned home, often very early in the morning. On this particular night, the girl decided to stay at home. The thought of studying in her father's and uncle's suffocating hole of a place that stunk of stale cigarettes, booze, aqua velva, and body odor repulsed her to no end. And even though Moira despised the fact that upon occasion her daughter would be subjected to that disgusting, child-beating uncle of hers, she had no choice in the matter. She didn't have custody of the girl. When Moira and Sam split, they agreed, for Megan's sake, they said, to have joint custody. The truth of the matter was this. Both Sam and Moira functioned better as part-time parents, so the joint custody thing was a blessing more than anything. But Mora still had her terms. To Sam, she said, if that delusional drunk so much as looks at her funny, never mind lays a finger on her, I'll kill you both. Mora tapped on the door with her fingernails. Go away, mother. Can I come in? Mora asked. Without waiting for an answer, she opened the door, surprised to discover it was unlocked. Megan, fully dressed, was sitting on the toilet seat, her hands cupped over her face, her head hung, rocking back and forth just inches above the floor. Part of her hair was sweeping the tile. The girl took her hands off her face and sat up and glared at her mother in a condescending manner, one that said, what do you want with me? Go away. <laughs> well, there's the look from hell if I ever saw it. Then delicately, you uh, threw up again, huh? Megan nodded slowly. Moira took a drag on her cigarette and let out a long exhale, a sort of sigh of relief. Nothing seemed to frighten this woman, but the thought of anything happening to her child was simply unbearable. She thought that perhaps this was the reason why she distanced herself from the girl, to protect herself. When she was a few years younger than her daughter, her twin sister, Megan, who was called Maggie, drowned at a summer cottage that her family rented out at Lake Massasecum in Bradford, New Hampshire. It was about 75 miles northwest of Frybury Falls off of Route 9, just 10 miles from Henniker. The story went like this. Maggie walked out into the lake, sliced her toe in a rock or something, lost balance, and hit her head on a pile of sharp rocks on the shore. She stood up almost as if nothing really happened, but must have been delirious because instead of walking back into the shore, she walked back out into the water. After only a few steps, the very shallow water dropped off dramatically to about eight feet or more. Everyone knew about this drop-off and was always warned not to step beyond a certain point. The irony of it all was that Maggie knew about this drop-off and was also a skilled swimmer, very advanced for her age. But the reality was this. She took a fatal blow to the head, and that was that. And the worst part of it was, if you can imagine, Mora witnessed the entire thing from ashore. She watched her twin's head bobbing up and down like a boy... Every few seconds, Megan yelled for her sister, help Mora, help me Mora. Each time Maggie said these words, mounds of water would rush down her throat and into her tiny lungs. Now I'm thinking if I have a couple more minutes, I'm not sure, I'm, not sure. I'm gonna have a really brief section of, the, of, of another chapter just to get a, a, a sample of that. Yeah, am, I do, am I doing okay with time? Okay, cause I wanna, yeah, be, yeah. I'm trying to, yeah. So that was a little taste of that. And I wanted to read, this is actually a little bit into the book about halfway. It's called, it's, it's the, the name of the novel is Little Town Blues and the name of the chapter is Little Town Blues. And this is actually um, an excerpt from the character, the very, very melodramatic Miss Julie. 
you know, and Miss Julie is the name of actually of an August Strindberg play that she kind of sort of demands that she be called because she's, you know, very theatrical. So this really speaks to the, the melodrama of, of the novel. And she's actually had an accident and she's in bed. Okay, so this is just kind of a feel for, for her escapades in this. Okay, so chapter 18, Little Town Blues. On Monday morning, June 25th, Miss Julie was hopping down the stairs on her one good foot pretending to be Anne Reinking. According to her, Reinking was the greatest of the Bob Fosse dancers and a genius choreographer. She especially loved her in Chicago. The way her hips and legs swayed, it was elegiac, like a serpent, so sexy, so seductive. In addition to Miss Julie's dreams of becoming a great stage actress and photographer, she also saw herself as a skilled jazz dancer. Miss Julie was also quite the aficionado of Fosse's Cabaret and the 1979 film All That Jazz, where the chief of police from Jaws, Roy Scheider, plays the pill-popping, chain-smoking, adulterer choreographer Joe Gideon, and Ryan King plays the comely cut queen Kate Jagger. In making this association, she imagined, if only for a second or two, and absurdly at that, what it would be like if her husband, the chief of police, were a trained dancer, a choreographer prancing through their estate like Peter Pan or Mikhail Baryshnikov, and standing in the middle of the living room next to all the leather furniture in his black spandex in a jaunty arabesque. <laughs> what a preposterous prospect, she thought, laughing, picturing her husband with those chubby legs of his moving to the song Cellophane from Chicago. Cellophane. Mr. Cellophane could have been my name, Mr. Cellophane, because you can look right through me and walk right by me and never know I'm there. Presently, she was listening to an old recording of Liza Minnelli's version of New York, New York, written by Fred Ebb and John Kander. She had always insisted that Liza was destined to sing the song, that Frank Sinatra's version didn't have the energy or the pizzazz to do it justice. In her pro professional opinion, Sinatra just sang the song. Liza performed it. Miss Julie was not a Liza Minnelli fan, however. In fact, she despised her in Cabaret. She thought that she was too over the top. Um, she always thought that Ryan King, the old beauty that she was, with those piercing uh, um, blue eyes and buck teeth that somehow complemented that comely countenance and 10 times the dancer, would have made a much better Sally Bowles. But no one belted the song out like Liza. Miss Julie held onto the railing, continued to hop it up and down on her good leg, and sang along. I want to wake up in a city that never sleeps To find I'm king of the hill, top of the heap Cream of the crop at the top of the hill These little town blues are melting away I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere It's up to you, New York, New York the lyrics couldn't have explained her life better, she thought, seeing herself as Sally Bowles, dressed in black leotards, black top, and a black hat slanted over her right eye. I want to wake up in a city that never sleeps, instead of this measly little town that always sleeps. I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. Someday when I get off these damn crutches, I'll go audition again. Never mind Boston. It'll be the real place, Broadway itself. These little town blues. These little town blues. These little town blues. This became her mantra, her curse. And I'll stop there. <laughs> oh my gosh, you brought us a whole performance. <laughs> <laughs> it gives, and it gives, since we're all kind of advertising our novels too, too, it gives you sort of that feel. It is, it's a performance piece in a way too. There's a lot of performance in the novel. And so. Yeah, I mean, I like the the singing the music the um the dialogue and the conversation but also yeah all the um influences that you can read in the text and and you can see how much has gone into it so um yeah that was fantastic thank you so much Dave well, thank you thank you <laughs> um so we have about 10 minutes for our audience Q&A um so I know some questions have been rolling in and I've been recording them, but if you have still have a question you'd like to ask, please go ahead and type that in the chat and um, I'll make sure we get to that. Um, but to start us off, um, I'll just run through the questions. So um, first of all, from Bob to JB, this is an excellent book. Looking forward to a sequel. Will you discuss the possibility? Well, Bob, that is a great question. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't discussed this with Cameron, 
exactly. Uh, but I'm going to give you an answer that would be like <clears throat> if a leader of a special operations task force was called before Congress to testify on something, and he might say something like this. I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of a second book, a sequel. I can tell you this. <clears throat> I don't know if the author is currently writing that or not writing that. <laughs> We've got somewhat of a, a method author, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll have to stay tuned for that. But um, for now, a question from Annie to Emily. What inspired you to write a love story? Hi, Annie. Thanks for asking. I did um, respond in the chat, but I will respond here as well. Um, so a little bit about my background is I've always wanted to be an author. I've always wanted to be a writer. When I was 19, I was pregnant with my first daughter, Ellie, who is now 19 and studying PA school. So I had to change careers. <laughs> I was originally going to go in um, go to college and focus on writing. And instead I went the medical route because I knew that I could get a degree that would give me a good, like well-paying job. I couldn't be a starving artist <laughs> as a 19 year old with a child and a single mom. So I started writing when stars line probably back in 2013 and just kept writing it and perfecting it. But I've always loved reading romance Nicholas Sparks is like my hero. <laughs> and I always wanted to write a story that took place in my hometown, which is Cincinnati, Ohio, and implement all the things that I love. So thanks for asking. Oh, oops, I made the um, cardinal sin of uh, staying muted. <laughs> um, but yes, I was basically saying thank you for your answer, Emily. Um, <laughs> um, now we have a question um, from Cam to Dave. As you worked on Little Town Blues, were you able to transfer any filmmaking skills to your novel writing process? Do you feel like Little Town Blues is an extension of your film work or is it more of a, a like a wholly separate endeavor of yours? Um, my, my, I'm not muted now. God, no, great, uh, great question. Very intuitive too, because um, I sort of, um, sort, sort of value interdisciplinary. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the, one of those sort of um, kind of jack of all trades, master of none type of where I'm, I'm sort of like I'm a, you know, I, 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 I sort of like to hop around with the arts because it's just like I think it's my, it's, it's my imagination that's really fueled. You know, instead of just saying I'm solely a novelist or I'm solely a filmmaker, but although I do all these things, they all inform the same thing. So this absolutely has, um, you know, has influence. And if, when you read the book too, and, and, and I think that what, what, what a big comment that a lot of people are, are making on this too, is just it's rich, jam-packed jam -packed with, um, with, uh, with references. I mean, it's like a kind of a, it's dripping postmodern, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's got references to plays and movies and songs. And, and I, th I think that a lot of those influence come from my own life too, where I think that it's, um, I grew up, I grew up in the eighties. I was a product of the 1980s and it was just pop culture became even part of our personalities. Like, you know what you thought through characters, you thought through, you know, and I, I thought that was so absolutely it's informed by, by film. Um, I actually even think the songwriting process and novel writing are very similar. I'm very, I'm, I love structure when it comes to the arts. Like for instance, when I write a song, it's about the, you know, you, you have a verse, you know, and then you've got the chorus, you have a bridge over here, that's sort of the distant cousin to the song, and then it comes back again. And I very much have that in mind when I, when I, when I structure like my films, my novels. So it's a great question too. So it's, it, it is, I think almost everything that I do informs, each, you know, even when I do my music, it's all an interdisciplinary sort of like smorgasbord <laughs> I guess yeah <laughs> yeah and yeah it goes right back to um what we had just briefly mentioned yeah there's so much that goes into um this novel and I, I think when someone's reading it they can really feel that um in the text so um yeah so 
Uh, we have a question actually for all of you, and then we've got a couple more individual questions, but uh, this is another question from Cam posed to everybody. Can you tell us something about each of your novels that only J.B. Blake or E.K. McCoy or David Gautier would know? Let us in on something behind the scenes. Um, maybe, J.B., do you want to kick us off? Yes, that's uh, easy for me. The uh, thing that's behind the scenes is that Hawk's reaction to seeing Leah for the first time was exactly my reaction to seeing a young girl a long time ago for the first time who became my wife. So Leah Parker, to me, is my wife, Carol. Amazing. Uh, really, I think that gives it an extra dimension that everyone wants to uh, hear from their authors. Um, Emily, do you have any sort of tidbits you can share with us? I do. And I actually first want to say my daughter is listening in. I want to say hi to Ellie. <laughs> She's a pre-PA school on mainland. So I just want to say hi. And JB, mm -hmm. she thinks you're so sweet. She loves, <laughs> she's like, oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> um, anyways, so all of my writing, I have like Easter eggs in it. So characters, dates, numbers, they all mean something to me, which uh, not a lot of people will know, except for my husband, my daughter, people that are really close to me. But in When Stars Align, there are some very personal experiences that inspired my story. Um, 14 years in the medical field, number one, but um, the way that Augie and Elsie break up and then what Elsie experiences after that um, is actually very true to my life. So um, losing my grandma within two weeks after a long-term relationship and somebody basically ghosting me. Um, all of that that happens in When Stars Line was inspired by my life. Mm, yeah, these, I, these life experiences from both of you just like enriching the story. I mean, you know, they say write what you know, but um, it's so true, you know, you get these incredible stories from that, but um yeah Dave any sort of uh behind I, the scenes info I think I'm going to just sort of extend this dialogue what JB and um EK said um it is, I think writing a novel is definitely a very personal experience and in a lot of ways you know there is even the the aspects that are the little talk about a lot of easter eggs <laughs> in here a lot of like in um that Definitely, I, I know where it comes from. It's a really interesting experience. My wife and I um, have been married for 25 years. Um, you know, very happily married. We've got a, got a 16 year old daughter. We've, you know, have had built a whole life together. And we're, we're like starting fresh right now too, because she's reading the novel. And she's never really read, you know, any of my former books, but she's reading this and she stopped, we're stopping along the way and having sort of, if, if every, every morning we have our coffee talk, as we call it, and we, we tend to sort of like have that be a great way to communicate and all that. And she's actually happened to be reading the book now. And she's like, I know where this comes from. I know what the, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's in, so in many ways, I think um, even those, you know, those little details, you know, that are fictionalized, right? you know, that she's so close to, she, she knows that. And so do I, but the rest of the world doesn't know that. So you're, you know, people are just going to read that as like, oh, this is a character trait or a character idiosyncrasy, you know? And I've always been fascinated by that when, whenever a question like this comes up with listening to, you know, other famous authors that, that I'm drawn toward, like, you know, John Irving or someone like that, or, you know, and then they kind of, they give a little bit of their say, yeah, this was influenced by that. And it pretty much, and, and just another quick part here too, is like, I really feel is that even though it's a novel, it's it's it is my memoir. It's it's my memoir that I've kind of chosen to sort of like put into this form. You know, I didn't want to write a traditional memoir like you know my life started this way or or, or even an excerpt from that too. But I love I love how art can do that. How you can take that even with my music. How I'm taking something that's going on in my life at that particular time and I'm able to sort of like take the trends and all that stuff and put it through this form. I, I'm a big fan of that. I think that's why I do so many things like filmmaking and theater. It's because I love that storytelling form. That's all the same thing though filmmaking, novel writing, um, the, you know, all these things are all basically, 
you know, they have tropes, they're storytelling, um, and they're meant to, to be projected into an audience. They're just done in slightly different forms, you know, and I think I like, and that's why, I, so in one way I do just one thing, but yeah, so I think this kind of came out as like a, the, the memoir that I wanted to write at this age. <laughs> mm, art is art is art, isn't it? Mm. So <laughs> yeah, these are all the examples of it, I'd say. Um, we've just got two quick questions I want to um, hit on real quick before we draw to a close. First, from Annie to JB, is Hawk your alter ego? No. Uh, no, uh, not really. Uh, the uh, He is really just from a creature that came into my mind when I figured out that there was a situation that I was responding to that I, I could not have helped or stopped. And uh, when I realized that, uh, thinking in a literary sense, I thought about, well, who could? And, and that's when Hawk the character of Hawk came in into my mind. And, and like I, I told the other two authors earlier before we all came on, uh, I dreamt this book into existence over the course of two years, every night, every night, adding a little bit to the story. And um, when I finally sat and wrote it down, it was about 50,000 words. And uh, that's a lot to carry in your mind, you know, for two years. <laughs> But uh, then I was able to add uh, more parts to it to, to kind of uh, fill it out and make a complete story. And, and Bob, if, if I was writing a sequel to it, there would be a lot more to tell about this story. So, Hela, I, I hope that qualifies as teasing, like you <laughs> told me, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, and then just one more question to round us out tonight. Um, another question from Annie, this time to Dave. Was it challenging to characterize a mother-daughter relationship in your novel, or did it come easily to you? Wonderful. Wonderful. Very, again, very intuitive question. I appreciate that. Um, I think part of my journey of, of being a male is to is to understand um, is to understand women more. And I was raised by a very very strong woman. Um, she she's got a lot lot of comp complexities going on. Um, and I think a lot of what's informed this novel is sort of that is sort of that upbringing. You know, even right down to you know certain characteristics of um, you know even even like you know that are, that are just kind of bringing in there. I actually. To, to kind of answer this question, I don't mean to like veer away from it, but I actually speaking of like a you know, not a dream. <laughs> I didn't have a story come to a dream, but I actually had a play that wrote itself. And I actually did a rewriting of, um, of it, it, the, uh, the medi medieval um, morality play called Every Man. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it said, but I actually took my wife's genealogy blog, rewrote, sort of like adapted that, um, and then rewrote it, you know, according to this play. So it's, a, it's called Every Woman, so I did. I I took the challenge of actually trying to embrace what um that that you know that experience was like too. But I I basically not specifically co-writing, but my wife and I sort of talked it out again during our coffee talk. We sort of talked, and and it wrote for itself. And I think that when I went back to the this novel had already been written, but I went back and I sort of tweaked the um the women the relationships between mothers and daughters and, and there's mothers and daughters were very rich part of me as a, as a male looking in my my mother and um uh grandmother had a very complex relationship and my wife and her daughter that type of stuff too so i've got a lot of that from an observer perspective too and then but by talking with my wife i kind of think that that's gives me the validity you know, um, and as well as like, I collaborate with women as well too, with with a lot of a lot of um, these ideas too. So, and and I think it kind of strengthens me. And I've always liked th that idea too of being able to write strong female characters because I think sometimes they're more interesting. I'm a big fan of the filmmaker Ingmar Bergman, male, but he really wrote female characters. Even his female co-stars, like Lee Ullman, would say that this man knows how to write women, and I think it's because he makes them as as human beings, not sort of as that that the the, the male voyeur 
you know, sort of like objectification, unfortunately, which which ends up happening sometimes. So that is where I'm at right now, too, especially as I get older and I sort of take a look at like that that idea of humanity. And but yeah, and it's 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 challenging. I make sure that it stays in check. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean, it's very um, I, I think I appreciate hearing, you know, hearing an author, a male author, especially talk about that and, um, you know, acknowledge that the challenge and the fruitfulness of that can come of that. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and with that, uh, I think it's about time that um, our event is drawing to a close. So I just want to say it was so wonderful to hear all three of you share these stories in your own voices and to share your thoughts and ideas and um, backgrounds. So thank you so much for being here with us uh, tonight or this afternoon. Um, and thank you to the audience for being with us to celebrate these fantastic writers. Um, don't forget that if you need gift ideas, you can order The Killer Half, When Stars Align, and Little Town Blues from the links in the chat. Um, and also consider checking out atmosphereprest.com to browse our new and forthcoming releases, to sign up for our email newsletter so you can hear about more events like this one, or to submit a book manuscript of your own. Feel free to submit your work to books at atmosphereprest.com and let us know that you attended today's event. We'll look forward to hearing from you, but until then, that's it. Have a festive December, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>